Nukes are back. Did you think that nuclear weapons were just an old story from the 60s? That they were nothing more than a memory from the past, like German spy movies or smoking in the office? Well, you're wrong. Atomic weapons are back with a vengeance. NATO 2030, NATO's new report, puts it very clearly. NATO continues to play a crucial role in maintaining both conventional and nuclear deterrence. With both conventional and nuclear firepower capability. Nuclear weapons have been a crucial pillar of NATO's collective defense from the outset. And those who thought that the Cold War was a thing of the past are also wrong. The report clearly states, today, NATO faces two systemic rivals, Russia and China. History is repeating itself. The world is caught up in a new arms race driven by NATO. But what is NATO and what happened with the Cold War? How did that go? Oh, smoother new port, fresher new port, smoother, more refreshing cigarette. The Cold War began as the Second World War ended. Much of the world was divided into two camps, the capitalist West and the Communist East. Together, they had defeated Hitler's fascism, but immediately afterwards, relations broke down. The West European and North American countries set up NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a nuclear-armed military alliance. A peace project, they said, to unite against the communist threat. The NATO narrative was simple. If you make trouble with one of us, you make war with all of us. It was the start of a disastrous arms race. In the 1980s, 70,000 nuclear weapons with unimaginable destructive power were deployed on both sides, enough to blow up the entire world. Doesn't sound very safe, does it? When the wall came down in 1989 and the Soviet Union fell apart, NATO had a problem. There was no enemy left, and everyone expected NATO to wind up. The world was hoping for a period of peace and disarmament. But the Western countries didn't want to say goodbye to the military project, so they changed the NATO narrative. I'm pleased to announce that my colleagues and I have begun a major transformation. NATO rewrote its own mission statement, from being an alliance for mutual defense to one with the freedom to intervene in other parts of the world. Since the end of the Cold War, NATO military interventions have taken place in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Libya. Thousands of civilians have been killed as a result, and nowhere has real peace been achieved. NATO countries also give support to inhumane regimes, such as Saudi Arabia, which has been waging a brutal war in Yemen since 2015 and is the major buyer of European and American weapons. Three billion dollars, 533 million dollars. The biggest man-made humanitarian crisis in history is happening right now in Yemen. 400,000 children are threatened with starvation. Military interventions and support for criminal regimes are not in keeping with NATO's self-image as a force for peace. The disastrous war in Afghanistan has devastated the country. Libya remains embroiled in a 10-year civil war. Think of the difference these war dollars can make in the reconstruction of these countries. Today, military expenditure is higher than ever before. Worldwide military expenditure has risen to almost 2,000 billion US dollars. 2020 saw a global increase of 3%, and 2019 and 18 were already record years. Okay, so some are gonna say the Soviet Union has fallen, but Putin is no saint, and there are new superpowers like China coming up, so we should not be naive about the dangers. But it's NATO that's driving the new arms race. Military investment is rising fastest in the NATO countries. Military budgets in the US and Europe are rising twice as fast as in the other continents. Behind the scenes, a powerful arms industry is making sure they are well served. 
they saw their sales increase by 8.5% in one year. For years, the so-called Russian threat has been cited as the reason for increasing military spending, even though Russia's military budget is barely 7% of NATO's. It is no surprise that NATO is facing more and more opposition. Protest movements are springing up all over the world, and public opinion is tilting. 80% of Europeans are resolutely against nuclear weapons. But in a world with so many different interests, how do you keep the peace? Well, cooperative security is the way to go. The basic principle is, I am only safe when you feel safe. If one camp arms itself, the other will feel unsafe and also arm itself. That's not good. So let's create a virtuous circle. If one side puts more effort into diplomacy and consultation, the other side will do the same. History has proven that the key lies in agreements that inspire trust. Peace is not a question of more arms and military. It's a question of diplomacy, disarmament, and human security. And that's a win-win. Disarmament not only reduces the risk of violent confrontations, it also frees up resources that are needed to invest in people and the environment. And that, in turn, can create more security, and that is good for all of us.